Hi, my name is Ogenus von der Planets. I'm going to introduce you to my work, which is uh, called The Primal Diet. This is a very brief class here, so uh, I will try to be as, uh, as concise as possible. But I got into uh, to health about 41 years ago when I was dying of uh, multiple cancers, uh, multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the blood and bone, stomach and lymphatic cancers. Uh, I had diabetes, psoriasis, angina pectoris, and bursitis, all incurable. And I was on my deathbed when a volunteer at the hospice introduced me to raw carrot juice and raw milk. And that began turning my situation around and reversed my diseases. Uh, over a long period of time, there's no magic bullet that I found. Um, you will have to set aside everything that you've ever learned to be even open to what I am going to tell you uh, to uh, consider it as possibility. And most people believe that bacteria, virus, pathogens, uh, fungus are all negative uh, responses in the body to toxicity. However, I look at it very differently. I look at it as if the fungus, the bacteria, the parasites, and the virus are AIDS reversing disease. The toxicity uh, enters the body, damages tissue, and then your body uses the bacteria, parasites, fungus, and virus to dissolve the dead tissue uh, and to eliminate it. The bacteria and the parasites are the most important. The parasites can eat almost 100 times their weight in 24 hours and discard 1 to probably 3% waste product. So those are very efficient janitors. Imagine that you being able to eat 100 pounds of uh, food in a day and then discard uh, in the feces, one or uh, three pounds of uh, waste matter. That leaves your body very, very little to, uh, to neutralize, to discard uh, via the lymphatic uh, activity. The uh, bacteria can eat about, uh, you know, about probably 50 times their weight in uh, 24 hours. They are very efficient. They produce a little bit more waste product but still very efficient janitors. Molds, uh, fungus, uh, which are yeast infections and different kinds of uh, um, funguses throughout the system. The mother of the fungus is called mycelium. And the mycelium can consume uh, a, a great deal of the waste products also, but they have more waste products. The virus, the virus are not alive. You know, we know that the fungus are alive, bacteria are alive, parasites are alive. Virus are not alive. They have no nucleus, they have no respiratory system, they have no digestive system. They are protein bodies which can either help the construction of something or dissolution. Most often, viruses dissolve toxicity. 300,000 varieties of, of virus specific to particular tissue within a cell in, in each, uh, each zone, and I will call intracellular zone, extracellular zone, and even the body as a zone. A gland can be a zone. A particular kind of virus is specific to a zone and a specific tissue within that zone, you won't be afraid of virus, uh, even though they dissolve tissue. The body makes viruses to dissolve tissue. This is such a misunderstood. A lot of people call them alive. The pharmaceutical industry would love to, for you to believe that they're alive and that they multiply erratically, uncontrolled, and of course you go for medication to try to stop it. And the same thing probably believe about parasites and bacteria and fungus. 
a virus will change every 24 to 72 hours. So a virus that existed today will not exist in three days. The implications of that are that if they make a vaccine for a flu, 18 months later, that, <laughs> that virus is, is long gone. When I did laboratory work, I um, took petri dishes that were fertile for cells, and when I uh, put uh, individually virus in those petri dishes, the virus did not multiply. They did not call so-called what they're saying self-replicate. That's like saying Tide soap self-replicates because it's found in every home. Viruses are everywhere in every cell. As I said, about 300,000 varieties just intercellularly for specific tissue. If you dissolve more than one type of tissue at a time, then of course the whole cell could be compromised. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry, of course, wants you to believe, that it's willy-nilly and they'll just dissolve everything within a cell. They show you the dissolution of that part and then they make it into this uh, B Hollywood movie horror episode, um, which has nothing to do with reality. When I introduced cells into the Petri dish with the viruses, of course, the Petri dish fertilized to keep cells alive doesn't mean it's a correct environment. And it's not a correct environment. It's a very toxic circumstance. It is nothing like what the blood serum is. So, of course, that cell is going to become compromised. It's going to start manifesting a virus to help clean itself because in the particular solution that's in the Petri dish, the body can't maintain uh, bacteria, it can't maintain parasites, and it can't maintain fungus. Sometimes it can maintain fungus or create maintain fungus, but that's rarely. So what you have is an environment, of a cellular environment, where the cell can't cleanse itself with the help of the, the symbiotic relationship with bacteria, parasites, and fungus. And the cells always try to cleanse and heal themselves and stay alive. That's why we can do so many uh, abusive things to our bodies with diet and, and in the environment and still survive and maintain. Maybe not well and full of disease, but we still seem to uh, exist. Cells in that Petri dish will multiply the virus. The whole virus um, are created within the cells. And of course, once they've done the work, they, they get expelled, uh, excreted, secreted from the cells themselves. So then you find a mass amount of virus in the Petri dish. But remember that virus are not alive. They cannot multiply. They cannot self-replicate. Can Tide soap self-replicate? No, we make it. Cells make virus. Once you understand that properties of cleansing, you will not be afraid of what is going on when there's a disease, illness, or sickness. You will let it have its course. The diet. Now, what I found is that um, and you'll look in any science book and it'll tell you that fats contain most of the poisons that, they're in, that are in the body. Fat is very important in our polluted society. A hundred years ago when there wasn't much disease, uh, even though there is said to have been a lot of disease, there wasn't a lot of disease. In fact, uh, in 1957 when I was 10 years old, now it's one in every two and a half, according to Samuel Epstein, uh, an MD who's uh, one of the world's greatest experts on uh, cancers. Fat is very, very important. Now we can look at different sources of fat. 
And when we look at sources of food at all, we have to take a look at our digestive tract. Vegetarians will say, oh, we're like the uh, frugivore and we should eat a lot of fruit like the primates. Now, the apes don't eat a lot of fruit. They, eat, uh, they do eat a lot of green bananas, unripe. And if you've ever tried to eat a green banana, it's almost impossible. It's very alamy. It makes the mouth pucker and dry. And they do fine with it. They're acclimated to it. And it's not high in sugar. So it doesn't have the effect like it does with the monkeys. It makes them crazy, erratic. The killer monkeys will go on a binge of eating uh, fermented fruit like figs. Um, about uh, 24 hours before they go on their killing spree, and then they kill anything that they find, other monkeys, um, rodents, anything they will kill. And that's that high sugar reaction on their brain and nervous system. Let's start in the mouth. Now, um, herbivores, uh, animals who eat uh, vegetation, have all molars. In our mouth, yeah, we have a few molars in the back for crushing, but almost all of our teeth are cutting. Sure, they cut into fruit, but it doesn't take much to cut into fruit. Uh, we also have four canines for ripping and tearing. If we travel down into the, the stomach, we find that we have a concentration of hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid isn't needed for vegetation, or very little is needed for vegetation. Uh, none is needed for fruit. So why do we have such a concentration of hydrochloric acid if we're not to be flesh eaters and dairy eaters? Now, the concentration of hydrochloric acid in the carnivores, uh, such as the canines and felines, they have 15 times the amount, relatively, in their stomachs. And they have... Uh, a very short digestive tract. Food passes in there through their systems in 10 to 15 hours. Our small intestine secretes hydrochloric acid all throughout intestines in small amounts. But it's equal to that of any carnivore, any other carnivore. If we eat vegetation, what happens to that hydrochloric acid? It neutralizes it. Well, why would our bodies be producing it if we were meant to be vegetarians. Um, we have lots of bacteria, and almost all of that bacteria, salmonella, um, various uh, kinds of salmonella. We have almost uh, 2,300 varieties of salmonella in the small intestines that helps us digest food. Uh, there are tribes in the world that are still primitive, and they carry the uh, trick worm uh, the, the whipworm, the pharmaceutical slant, the medical profession slant on having the trick worm, they say it's a disease and call it trichinosis. All the cultures who live with the, the trick worm in their intestines thrive. They have no digestive difficulties. So the trick worm is something that we should still have, but we don't. It, it pre-digests the food for us, breaks it down, just like salmonella and other digestive bacteria and our acids. If you look at the work of Joel Weinstock, Dr. Joel Weinstock, and Stock and, um, gastroenterologist from the University of Iowa, he showed that giving the whipworm to his uh, patients that had inflammatory bowel syndrome, IBS, that uh, they completely were asymptomatic within five to six days uh, after incubation of the whipworm in their uh, intestines. And he found also that the pigs, who were too clean at the university and very sick when he introduced the whipworm there, uh, that the pigs got well and they digested fine. So a lot of things you're taught to be taught to be afraid of, you should not be afraid of. These we have coexisted with for millions of years that the human body has been around. All the chemicals that are introduced in our society have only been around for 80 years. Some of them, of course, for a couple of hundred years, 
but uh, not to the variety that we have now, which is something like 60,000 new chemicals we've produced in the last 50 years. So expecting our bodies to adapt to these chemicals is quite an, quite an extraordinary um, feat of the imagination, but the pharmaceutical industry and the uh, the industries in general want us to believe that so that we'll continue consuming uh, their products. The vegetarian animal also has a digestive tract two and a half times longer than ours, the herbivores. They pass through food through in 48 hours. We pass food through in 24 hours. They have 60,000 times more enzymes to disassemble the cellulose molecule to get the fat and the protein from it. But you look at any fecal matter from uh, an herbivore and you'll see it is still 30 to 35, even 40 percent uh, pulp, fibers that they still haven't digested. And we're told that we digest vegetation, but we don't. What vegetation does in our systems as, as our system breaks it down the little that it can, these alkaline juices are produced and they neutralize the hydrochloric acid and, um, and stun the, and make uh, immobile and uh, uh, non-functional the acidic bacteria that would normally digest meats and dairy. I, of course, was a vegetarian. I went through many stages of diets to learn what I learned. And then when I was so confused and not many things were working consistently, um, I had to say, okay, I'm, all, I'm going to test all of these things and what works I'm going to embrace, what doesn't I'm going to discard. So to make a long story short, as I went through all these different stages of diets um, from partially cooked, uh, believing that you had to eat vegetables and they had to be cooked to be digested, which is true, but then you have lots of toxins and free radicals when you cook a food. Raw foods are best. They have lots of enzymes. Enzymes are not alive. People think like virus. Enzymes are alive. Many people say live enzymes, but enzymes are just like virus. They are protein bodies that either construct or destruct. They either decompose or they help build. In the raw foods, we get lots of them that are in a particular shape. And of course, our, our pancreases are majorly responsible for the recombining of those for human cells. The vitamins uh, are uh, altered starting at about 118 degrees. They're all um, incapacitated, in other words, they don't what they're, do what they're meant to do by the time you reach 127. Enzymes, they are fractionated and then they don't have the same ability to construct and deconstruct. Raw foods will provide with more nutrients. There are varieties of toxins that are formed from cooking foods. In my book, um, The Recipe for Living Without Disease, in the last 50 pages, I named the major ones that we've identified, but that's only like 36 uh, of them. And there are many, many more that, of course, are uh, much smaller than those that we've identified. Uh, so if you want a list of those, they're in my book. So let's get back to fats. Digesting fats. Is, uh, is a little is more time consuming than digesting any other nutrient. The liver is responsible for making the bile that helps fractionate the fat molecules to be reassembled, reassembled for cholesterols or distributed around cholesterols are fats. No food contains cholesterols. Um, basically, our body takes fats breaks them down with bile, varieties of bile, just like you have varieties of virus, you have varieties of um, bile that, that fractionate the fat molecules to help them be reassembled with enzymes in a particular cholesterol form. And we use about 60 varieties of cholesterols. 
A third are used for lubrication. A third are used for uh, energy and building. And the other third are used to make virus and other solvent compounds to dissolve toxicity and neutralize it in the body. So fats are very, very, very important in our society. I found that butter um, is probably the most effective and important to help people get well, especially when it's in a combination with unheated honey. So raw, unsalted fat, raw, unsalted butter is the primary source of quicker healing. If we take a look at the finest, most easily digestible fat, I would have to say it's in the egg. Uh, eggs uh, in the high protein in the egg white. Our bodies digest those in about 23 minutes. And no other food can be digested that quickly. Milk takes at least, warm milk, takes at least six hours to digest whereas eggs digest in about 23 minutes. And I've given some uh, case histories in my books, We Want to Live and the Recipe for Living Without Disease, that demonstrate. And I'll just give you one example. An MD called me from uh, the East Coast about uh, 10 years ago, and she said, I have an emphysemic patient that was diagnosed about seven years ago. She's been on machines and mainly bedridden for the last two years, and she's most likely going to die this weekend. And I said, well, you're calling me a little late, aren't you? And she said, well, you know, I'm a doctor. I have my family's welfare to think of, and, you know, as doctors, we're not allowed to suggest anything other than medical procedures until the patient has suffered and not improved for 10 years. The only thing I can suggest that you do is get 10 to 15 dozen raw eggs and put one at her bed table and ask her to eat one as often as she can. This is on Thursday night. Then I got a call on Monday morning uh, by a very raspy voice woman who said, the eggs worked, uh, what else do I eat? And I said, well, who are you? So she explained who she was. And um, yeah, I told her to eat some raw meat, but mainly focus on eggs because if you have that bad of a disease that you're ready to die, you need to concentrate on cleansing and healing and not and very little on digestion. So eggs are your best bet to, uh, for uh, uh, cleansing and healing because they're so easy to digest. However, eggs alone will cause tremendous fat loss and weight loss if you're not eating a tremendous amount. And that uh, emphysemic woman ate 33 a day on Saturday and Sunday, so she ate 66 in those two days. Of course, it, she wouldn't have lost any weight with 33. If you have, let's say, 22 a day, you're not going to lose weight unless you're a very large man or a very large woman, and of course, you're going to lose weight. Um, but eggs in combination with milk, like for milkshakes and honey, a little extra cream, very, very nutritive efficient and will also help build weight on the body. Cream is the only fat that feeds the brain and nervous system. Butter does not, but a micro amount. Um, cream, for some reason, when the body breaks it down, and it takes a long time to digest cream. There are many more varieties of bile that are required to break down and uh, many different varieties of cholesterol formed from cream as opposed to butter. However, butter is more efficient to lubricate and, uh, and cleanse and to give strength to every other cell in the body except for the brain and nervous system. Other fats that can be used would be pressed oils. But we have to be very careful. Those are very isolated nutrients. Oils are very low in nature in lettuce, maybe 2 3%. In olives, you have a tremendous amount of fat, probably a good 50-60% uh, ratio um, calorie-wise in, in olives. However, your vegetable oils and uh, olive oil long enough crystallize in the human body. 
the herbivore stays about 101 to 105 degrees. The human gets about 98.6 and lower. So what happens with vegetable oils in the human body, if they are made as part of the, the cells, they have a tendency to crystallize at that temperature, at the lower temperature. So we'd have to be in constant fever to utilize those fats properly. There's another fallacy produced by industry, the medical profession, the USDA and the FDA, that animal fats, that meat fats, cause arteriosclerosis and heart disease. When in the tribes that eat meat, that mainly eat meat like 90% of their diet, cooked cholesterols are not our problem if they're from animal fats. Saturated fats are not our problem unless they're highly cooked. Then they can cause gout and other diseases, like the uh, tribes who do eat cooked meats. They have uh, gout, they have uh, osteoporosis, uh, kidney problems, and bladder irritations. But they don't have any severe diseases that we have, like cancers. The tribes who eat all raw, like the, uh, or at least 90% raw, uh, like the Fulani, who used to live 90% on milk and dairy products, uh, no diseases, not even dental caries. Eskimos, 90% animal matter, all raw, no arteriosclerosis, no heart disease, no cancers, no dental caries. The first Eskimo to be diagnosed with cancer was in 1936, and that was after about 80 years of the Eskimos who lived with the colonies eating cakes and sugar and developed those diseases. Any pressed oil is a very concentrated oil. You only have oil-soluble fats and activity in them. When you have a whole food, then you have uh, the variety of water and oil-soluble fats and vitamins and enzymes. And in a higher proportion that meets our body's standards and needs. We need a lot more water-soluble vitamins and enzymes um, than we do oil-soluble. As a treatment for a very serious disease, the concentrated fats can be a great benefit to deal with all the toxicity that's breaking down tissue in our bodies. Raw meats, that includes red meat, fish, seafoods, and fowl, are the only proteins that I've seen able to regenerate brain and nerve tissue. Additionally, the raw meats help regenerate tissue much quicker and in greater quantities. I found that eating mainly animal products is the most efficient. Very little carbohydrate is important because the body produces uh, advanced glycation end products and uses carbohydrates as glycogen. When the body uses a protein sugar like pyruvate in conjunction with glucagon to make glycogen, uh, there is very little advanced glycation end product produced. Now, Columbia University found that in the human body, 70 to 90 percent of that advanced glycation end product stores forever in the system, creating a very sticky environment in the system, advancing it toward high yeast infections, lots of fungus, uh, lots of brittle tissue, dry tissue. So we need to minimize the amount of sugars that we consume. Uh, honey is a good one that does not convert because when the bee collects the nectar, it swallows it. It predigests it. It makes an insulin-like substance or several varieties of insulin-like substances which convert the carbohydrates in the honey into enzymes for digesting mainly uh, protein and fats, which is exactly what we need. So that is a high carbohydrate food that does not create a lot of advanced glycation in pro products as other high carbohydrates do. So we need to alkalinize the blood fairly well 
uh, from eating, you know, a, a highly acidic diet. If you're going on the primal diet, uh, eating mainly dairy and, and meats and eggs. So vegetable juice, mainly green vegetable juices, are the things to consume to keep the blood a little bit alkalinized because of the toxicity we have in our systems. Uh, eat, then eating meats, of course, and then the dairy will take care of almost everything else. We can use a little bit because we're so toxic. We can use a little bit of fruit once a day to help cleanse the body to make the alcohols necessary to make the viruses and to break down fats a little bit better to be utilized as cleansers. Alcohol is in, in the body is necessary to make viruses, to make other soaps uh, in conjunction with the fats, but it's mainly fats that are utilized uh, to, um, to cleanse the body. Now we're getting short on time here, so I'm going to try to make as, uh, as, as brief as possible. So what I suggest is, is a diet. Uh, start the day off with a little vegetable juice. Then to make sure that you keep the brain as alert and focused as possible, you want to minimize the amount of carbohydrates from the advanced glycation end products that are produced making the neurological fluid in the blood sticky and the lymphatic system sticky. So you will keep much more focused of mind uh, if you keep your carbohydrates very low and don't eat your fruit meal until in the afternoon. So you have a meat meal in the morning, always with fat. So that way you won't burn, you won't alter your, your proteins into fat. Now the body can take a carbohydrate, can make a protein out of it, can make an acetate out of it, which is fat, an acetone, but it is not it is a very complex pro process and it isn't as easy and efficient. When you're talking about helping people who are ill or want to be the most efficient in sports, you have to minimize digestive time. You have to minimize the energy that the body puts out in digestion. Therefore, you want to consider foods that are already uh, easily altered into what we need them. So, of course, eating butter with the, um, with the meat meal uh, reduces the chance that the body will take the protein and make it into a fuel, either too much pyruvate, which is a protein sugar, or too much acetate, which is a fat. So you have a little bit of butter with your meat meal. Then several hours later, you have... Uh, a milkshake just to calm the body and relax it. And then about two to three hours later, another vegetable juice. And then an hour or two later, your fruit meal. And always eat fruit with meat. I mean, uh, fruit with fat. Always eat fruit with fat because you want to slow those carbohydrates down. And remember that the body needs very little carbohydrates. Only like 5% of your diet uh, for carbohydrates to make alcohols to help utilize fat as energy and as, as soap uh, in every other function that uh, the body utilizes with fat and binding with poisons and holding on to it. So you have to have your fruit and fat together, and then several hours, two, three hours later, have another vegetable juice. Then maybe an hour to two hours later, have another meat meal. Then before you go to bed, have maybe a cup of milk, warm milk. If you drink milk cold, there's a problem. Um, now a lot of people think that uh, dairy is a very bad thing. However, dairy was even used by Hippocrates to completely reverse emphysema, bronchitis, tuberculosis, diabetes, and a completely raw milk diet. So. The fallacies uh, about, uh, about dairy being a bad thing is, is not a correct, um, is not a, a, a realistic, uh, scientifically proved myth. It's just a myth. Uh, if you look at my uh, report uh, that Dr. Douglas and I wrote, or I wrote it, and he allowed me to use his research and, and his voice, 
uh, the report in favor of uh, natural milk or the report in favor of raw milk. They were written in two different forms, those two different names. And you'll see all the history on how um, raw milk has, uh, has helped. Pasteurized milk, you know, your calcium is cauterized. A lot of your nutrients are cauterized, and yes, people are allergic to it. Many people are allergic to it. But I've only found about 1% of all those people who have allergies to pasteurized milk still have an allergy to raw milk. And that may be a temporary thing, and I tell how to get beyond that within my recipe book. Uh, to get beyond that uh, milk allergy so that you can consume delicious dairy, you know, so I can have ice cream and cheesecakes and things like that, like that to uh, offer my recipe book. Also, you want to drink milk or have eggs or have meat during the night. When you go five hours without eating, because we're so toxic, I assume, that the red blood cells become cannibalistic and eat each other to get the protein. Even if you were 700 pounds, that would mainly be fat and water weight, but you would still lack protein. So by getting up during the night and having something to eat, you're going to prevent the anemia that is caused every day when people go five hours without eating during the night. So you know how people wake up uh, anemic in the morning. They're listless. They're lethargic. So they go for some kind of caffeine or other stimulant, whether it's soda, coffee, or chocolate, whatever it might be, or a high sugar dose to raise their blood sugar. Uh, because of the, um, uh, the blood cells have been uh, consumed. And in a three hour period, you could lose up to uh, five, eight tablespoons of red blood cells. That's severe anemia. So to avoid that, what you can do is if you're a hyperactive person and you wake up after five hours and drink some raw milk or eat some raw eggs and you can't go back to sleep, then the best thing to do is set your alarm for three hours, get up and eat something at that time, then you have five hours to sleep before you eat again. And that's much more efficient. So that's this course. It was a crash course. Uh, I've never given such a crash course before. A little befuddled in some of this delivery because I felt uh, slightly rushed. But there you have it. If you're interested in more of my work, you can get my book, um, the, uh, We Want to Live, uh, subtitled The Primal Diet. Then my other book, The Recipe for Living Without Disease. Uh, to read more about my work, you could also go to uh, www.wewanttolive, the title of my first book. But the TO, the we, went to, we Want to Live, the TO is the number two. So it's We Want to, number two, live. We want to live .com. Uh And then you can read that. There's lots of testimonials, and there's a lot more information and also ways to order the books. So everyone, I hope you enjoy your courses and that you develop into very wonderful healers. Thank you and have a great year.